you to start off with again. Thank you everyone for coming this afternoon, especially for this particular topic, clinical mental health supervision after a client suicide. Um, I realize that this is not necessarily always the most fun topic. It can be it can be intimidating. It can even be scary for folks. So I appreciate your willingness just to kind of come and learn and, and talk about things. I want to do a little bit of level setting first with just some information about how suicide um, can impact our supervisees and then talk a little bit about some things that we can do in supervision, in particular, some things that were found um, from my recent dissertation study that looked specifically at how counselor experience, counselor supervisors experience client suicide and some of the things that they found themselves doing in supervision. So the first thing you may be wondering is why listen to me, which I completely understand. That's a valid question. So just for you to learn a little bit about me, even though I have some friendly faces in the audience, um, I recently graduated with my PhD in counselor education supervision. I've been in this current position with the CJCCOE for a little over three years at this point. Um, prior to that, I worked in emergency psychiatric and crisis services. I also worked um, for over 10 years as a clinical supervisor. Um, outside of my full-time work, I also am the training CE and certification coordinator for Light After Loss in Stark County, Ohio, which is a nonprofit that works exclusively with suicide loss survivors with peer support. And we also do lots of education about working clinically with suicide loss survivors. And then I, of course, also take a look at that supervision component. So while I'm working through some of the slides today, I always like to ask the audience if you feel comfortable sharing, and you don't have to, um, but if you feel comfortable doing so in the chat, maybe just share why you decided to come today, why this topic is important to you. Um, I try to be very transparent. The topic is important to me because I have been, or I am a suicide loss survivor multiple times over, both in my personal and professional identity. Um, and I had both a positive, a beneficial, and a very negative experiences on the professional side after these suicide losses. Um, so for me, it's it's something that I have a lot of interest in and that I think we can do a lot better about, which is part of my passion area for it. So if you feel comfortable, please feel free to share in the chat why this is important to you. And before we go any farther, I'm going to put this up here and I'm going to read it out loud. So for folks who need to hear stuff and not just read it before we start, I want to make it super clear that having a client die by suicide does not make anyone lesser. Having a response to this loss also does not make any clinician or supervisee less of a professional nor incompetent to remain in the field. We need to do better to prepare our clinicians and supervisees for this type of loss of a client to suicide and our agencies and organizations to provide appropriate support after such a loss. One of the, I had a, a clinician reached out to me recently who is now a suicide loss survivor. This just happened a few weeks ago. And they just wanted to have a conversation because it was a it was a fresh loss. Um, it was a client they had been working with for, I, I think, a few years. I didn't ask a, a ton of details. But one of the things that I said to them that they reflected back was really important for them to hear was I said, you know, this, this happening doesn't negate all the good work you did with that person. It just doesn't. And no one had ever said anything like that to them before. Um, and so they found it, you know, I, we said it a couple of times over and over again. She even, you know, said it for herself that, you know, the work I did with this person isn't negated because of, you know, this decision and this outcome. And I think that's something we don't always think about. So to level set with a little bit of, you know, here's the fun part, right? Here's some of the data. Here's some, some information just to put out with, to give us some context, so there's been a couple different studies that have looked at how many clients that complete suicide may have been in counseling or in some kind of mental health care at the time of their death. In 1999, it was about 50%. Um, there was another study done back in 2018 that is looking at about the same. They were engaged in some kind of mental health treatment at the time. Now, we all know that is a huge spectrum of things, right? It could have been outpatient. It could have been one diagnostic assessment. It could have been intensive outpatient. They could have just been released from a psychiatric facility, which we know, of course, is a high risk time. Um, so just some things to be keeping in mind and be considering that, you know, the reality is that this does happen when folks are, are under our care, right? So that means that it will impact us. 
And it means that it can also impact our supervisees, whether they are seasoned clinicians, you know, with their own license, or if they are um, unlicensed folks in, in graduate school. So this is, it's a possibility and we don't always, you know, think about that. And there's a lot of reactions, right, that can happen when, you know, we lose somebody to suicide. Um, there's there's all literature about what it's like to experience a suicide loss and what those things are. Um, but again, what I always reiterate is trying to remember as supervisors, right? Like here's kind of that human piece of supervision. We have to remember that, you know, any type of death, accident, suicide, expected, right? If it's maybe a terminal issue or something like that could trigger some kind of response. Where's the grief response, a trauma response, right? And that response can come from a whole amalgamation of things about that particular individual, right? It has to do with their personal background, maybe some of their belief systems, the specifics of what happened with the death, as well as sometimes how other folks react to the death and like the reaction that they bring to the person who is impacted. Um, so it's really important that even though I'm going to talk about what some typical reactions are, everybody's individual, everybody's a little different. So this is just to kind of give you some context. And like I said before, even grieving the death of a client from suicide doesn't make anyone less of a, a, of a clinician or a professional. And having a grief response doesn't indicate that anyone shouldn't be in the field um, or is unable to work in our field, right? We all have separate and overlapping experiences that are going to guide what happens, you know, after something like this occurs. And I could tell many stories of many different reactions that occurred, including my own. So again, as context, just to think a little bit about what are potential reactions to client suicide from your supervisees, there's different emotional reactions, there's some cognitive reactions, there's a lot of feelings of helplessness, uh, there may be, you know, decreased ability to kind of deal with day-to-day -day things, whether that be family things, honestly, office stuff, right? Like, we would, you know, you have audio issues on Zoom, if you're also, you know, kind of in a, in a grief space, that might be what ends your day. Right. So it's just important to to remember those pieces. Some other reactions, you know, specific to clinicians is, you know, questioning clinical abilities, you know, lack of confidence in their work, uh, worries about litigation. Um, this comes up a lot, but I do want to be very clear that the litigation related to client suicide, one is minimal. And then two ones that actually end up in court are even more minimal. So if you think of the amount of litigation related to client suicide is this big, the amount that actually gets to court is quite tiny. Um, but that fear is out there because that fear is kind of put into us during, during graduate school and, and sometimes by the organizations and agencies, right? Um, people have considered retirement, people have considered leaving the field, they have distress, you know, possibly related to publicity around the suicide, especially if it's a youth or potentially somebody well-known in the community. Um, some other things that we've seen, a lot of self-blame, um, sense of failure to prevent the suicide from occurring, um, increased projection of blame, especially if they feel the, that the suicide was preventable, um, perceived blame. And, and honestly, unfortunately, in our field, there may be actual blame from colleagues, coworkers, personal contacts, people that just don't understand um, the concept of suicide after one of my professional losses. Um, my mother found out about it through another stream of information. I didn't break confidentiality, don't worry. Um, but she was talking to me about it and saying things like, well, I just don't understand. Like, well, he saw a mental health clinician like two weeks ago. Like, why didn't they catch it? Why didn't they do something? And I had to sit there and go, that was me, <laughs> like internally. You know, so you don't know what kind of reactions folks are having to the person, right? To the clinician around them. Um, there was another piece of information I forgot I wanted to mention on here. Ohio Moss here in Ohio did their own study back in 2016 to take a look at, you know, different mental health clinicians reactions to suicide and what happened. Um, I think it's important to know that over 90% believed that the suicide was preventable. So that alone in itself can lead to some self-blaming, right? Taking responsibility for a suicide if we believe it's preventable. Um, 13% took time away from work, 15% considered retirement, and a third considered a complete career change. 
um, whether that was to leave clinical work and maybe work in records or in human resources or another part of the field, or they just left, they wanted to leave completely. So this is also a workforce related issue. And as supervisors, we need to be thinking about that and keeping that in mind. Um, other reactions, you know, but there's not every reaction is negative, right? Other reactions that we've seen are just an increased awareness of suicide risk, maybe integrating some more things into diagnostic assessments, into screenings, into follow-up, um, having some more structured management of clients that have a known suicide risk. Um, we have also seen increased utilization of other options, right, in hospital and inpatient settings like observation, extra checks, engaging that client in more activities to kind of keep them occupied. Um, and another positive outcome can also be, you know, the learning piece of having more communication and information sharing among treating clinicians, especially if they're not all from the same agency. So, again, you know, these are reactions, but there's there's can be some good and some learning that can come from this as kind of a, as some post-traumatic growth. One of the biggest things, though, I think supervisors need to be thinking about when considering supervisees is this feeling of responsibility for the suicide. Um, again, like I mentioned, you know, over 90 percent of folks, you know, on that survey in Ohio from 2016 truly believed that the suicide was preventable. And if any of you are involved with uh, public health, um, public health is a very strong message about suicide, that all suicides are preventable. Um, there's also the Zero Suicide Institute that, you know, really pushes kind of a public messaging idea that, you know, all suicides are preventable. Um, and the reality is that's not true, right? Um, but that's not the message kind of put out into the universe a lot. And that can be sometimes really hard for a clinician who has lost someone to suicide to reconcile if they're getting a lot of messages that it is, it's all preventable and you're there to prevent it and you should be preventing it. And the reality is, we don't control their lives and they made they made that decision right and and we as with everybody else in their life are left to react to it so when a supervisee kind of holds on to this feeling of responsibility for the suicide there's a lot more intense emotional reaction um you know the irritability lowered mood you know, crying spells, poor sleep, all those things can be much more intense. There can be a much more pronounced low self-esteem and a significant increase in the self-doubt about their professional capabilities, right? And, and their competencies and their ability to work in the field. So they're already thinking this. And if they're also getting messages from colleagues, co-workers, anything that even has like the tiniest glimmer of blame, they will latch onto it and hold onto it. So as supervisors, as leaders in your in your agencies, this is this is a, a concept you really want to think about. There are also some things specific about supervisees that we want to be considering, right? For folks that are at graduate level or maybe on their first year of license, if you're a social worker, MFT, counselor, um, they're still in a developmental stage, right, to become a clinician. So they have limited experiences. So one of the ways I really like to make this really clear is one of the first suicides um, that I, you know, that I went through that I experienced was of an individual who was only 16 years old. I was working in crisis and emergency services. And at that point, I didn't have a lot of experience. I think it was in maybe my first 18 months in that work. So I didn't have a lot to balance it out. You know, later on in my career, when I experienced a different uh, client suicide, it was after I had closed with them. It was about a year out from the last time I saw them. I literally had hundreds, if not thousands of other experiences to kind of balance out. Yes, this person, you know, died by suicide. Yes, this is a loss. Yes, I have feelings about this. And at the same time, I also know there are hundreds, if not thousands of folks that didn't, you know, that didn't die by suicide that I've worked with, right? But supervisees may have limited experience to kind of draw from to do that balance and that kind of self-check, if you will. Um, they already may, might feel a little bit more vulnerable to the loss of a client. Um, that sometimes can depend on how suicide is prevented in, presented, I'm sorry, in graduate programs. Um, if graduate programs are significantly focusing on litigation and, you know, all the things you have to do after and kind of putting the fear of it into graduate students, that may be something you have to help them navigate a bit. Um, if they've never gone through it, right, they're going to feel more vulnerable anyway. They don't have other experiences with death and loss or suicide. 
Um, you know, one of the things that we also see with supervisees is they may develop a feeling of being afraid of client contact after a suicide. Sometimes this can be a very, to very similar clients, and sometimes this can be to clients overall. A few other things with supervisees, just to keep in mind, again, if they're very early in their career, they just may not have as much confidence to draw from, and then it starts decreasing anyway. And what they can do in their work, you know, feelings of being incompetent or they shouldn't be there, lots of feelings of isolation, especially if you're working with supervisees who are graduate students, because typically when they're when, once they've hit internship, they're not in a bunch of other classes where they can gain other support. Um, they're not maybe as engaged with their campus anymore, right? Because they're coming to the end of their matriculation. So they're not as engaged otherwise with support. So again, it's just other things to be aware of. They can get really preoccupied. Um, the danger there is that they could become distracted from the care of their other clients. That's very real. That can definitely happen. Um, and also supervision has a lot of influence on this. Um, you know, how you react as a supervisor can highly influence, you know, how they do those conversations, how you help them navigate it can really, really be uh, highly impacted, um, especially if they get any, again, that glimmer of doubt, that glimmer of blame, that glimmer of judgment, it's going to be exemplified for them just very naturally. Um, one of the other things we do see sometimes with supervisors is sometimes, I'm not saying anybody in this room would do this, but sometimes we have seen that supervisors will pull away from their supervisees and clinicians that have had a client suicide because of their own fears about litigation or that they're going to get pulled down with the ship or kind of whatever that whatever that is, it does happen. So don't be don't be one of those supervisors. So some of the things that came out of my research was, you know, after a supervisee experienced a client suicide, supervisors were doing some pretty specific things. In particular, they were having a lot more engagement. And this is definitely something you should be doing with your supervisee after they have a loss like this. You should have much more contact with them and not just formal contact where you're having a formal meeting and you're sitting in like your office to talk about things. Stop by their office, you know, give them a call. These do some informal contacts too. Um, it just helps them it helps them feel connected to somebody. Um, lots of focus on processing, emotion labeling, and feeling expression, right? Allow them to express things safely. And when I say that, you know, be mindful of if there's going to be any kind of investigation or review that this process, right, allowing them to talk through it is not part of an investigative or review process right? Your supervision is supposed to be a safe place for them too. So they need to have that space to talk about the guilt they feel and the blame they feel. And then that's also opportunities for you to one, normalize those reactions, right? And then help them work on the self-talk to kind of move past those reactions, including providing them with some of the data that you got today to help normalize, like, this is a normal reaction. It doesn't make you lesser, right? We need to kind of navigate forward from this. We also saw temporary changes to clinical worker role right? Um, sometimes they were moved to maybe slightly less high, high need clients or teams temporarily sometimes worked with a different population, just kind of give them that cognitive and clinical break, if you will. Um, and, you know, lots of increased encouragement for wellness, self-care, taking time away from work, uh, really encouraging folks to, to use the time that they, that they should. Um, so you saw, so increasing your time and your contact with the supervisees is going to be critical. Um, and again, as you as supervisors, there's reasons for this, right? You're supposed to be responsible and responsive <laughs> to your supervisory needs. And, you know, this means you're going to have to dedicate some more time and energy to that, to that one, which is going to be hard. And you're going to still have to navigate and balance, making sure that you give appropriate time to the rest of your supervisees that don't have this issue going on, um, there are many times where if you have gone through this and you feel comfortable doing so, sharing your experience can mean a lot to your supervisee. Um, there is a lot of, you know, in my study, this, when, when a supervisor did this, the supervisor was viewed as very, um, as very supportive. Um, it was also a way to open the, the conversation up for questions and concerns and for them to learn and have some mentoring, right, about these different things. Um, again, also balanced with 
as a supervisor, it's also still appropriate for you to monitor for actual impairment, not struggling, not being down, not having a reaction, but talking about impairment, right? Where they're not able to, to take care of other clients. You still need to monitor for that. And, but those other interventions should help give them a break before this becomes an issue, right? And as you're doing this, you need to work with them and continue that conversation, right? So even though I'm saying be really supportive, it doesn't mean that they couldn't become impaired. They absolutely could but they could become impaired from a lot of other things, not just a client suicide. So you don't need to treat it any differently. You still monitor for that. There's a lot of different interventions that you can do. We talked about the increased contact. We talk about process and emotion labeling, um, the self-disclosure piece, changes to schedule clinical workload. This is just a couple more specific examples, um, population shifts, um, maybe moving them to, either two or maybe away from intakes or diagnostic assessments kind of depends on maybe what they were doing before. Maybe their the complexity of their caseload, maybe the caseload size. But what I want to make clear is these are not long-term. You're not permanently changing, right, what they do. These, this is temporary to kind of help alleviate the initial things of what's going on and helping them work through those initial reactions. Other things, making sure you're initiating conversations about this, right? This should, the when a client dies by suicide should not be the first time in supervision you're talking about client suicide. Um, if nothing else, it should be a reminder of what's going to happen next, right? Talking them through the steps, talking them through your role um, and what may happen, answering their questions, um, you know, all of that. And also understanding that that whole process with a loss and in particular a suicide loss is going to take time. It may be a longer timeline than you necessarily think it should be or might be. The supervisee may not know how long that's going to take or, or what they need, but the important thing is to be asking um, and always looking at what's the agency doing, what's the organization doing that really should be a part of this, right? You know, one of the things that, you know, if this, the supervisor's reaction is highly influential, but also highly influential is the reaction of those around them and their leadership as well. Um, I spoke to many supervisors who had really unfortunately um, very negative experiences having to go through reviews of, and it's a normal thing that happens, right? When there's a client death, we have to review. We of course want to see if there, if there was a systems-based issue that needs to be addressed, if there's a policy-based issue that needs to be addressed, it's hard to do that and separate it from the person, right? That's really hard. So you, as an organization, want to make sure that whoever is in charge of doing those interviews and talking to those folks is, is well prepared, right? And has some skill with those conversations to ask difficult questions without placing blame. That doesn't mean it's easy. It's, it's very hard. Um, but it, it's, it's just something to be aware of. Um, I did have one, uh, participant in my research study talk about that when their supervisee, so, so someone right acting on their license was going to be interviewed as part of this review, the interview physically barred the supervisor from being even in the room. And so that person, that supervisee who had never gone through an experience like this before had their support person, you know, taken away from them. Supervisor is very clear. I'm not here to talk. I'm not going to participate. I just want to be a presence for them to be supportive because this is really hard and the interviewer barred that from happening and it, and it just felt very unnecessary and it led to the supervisee feeling that they were being targeted um that they were being blamed and that they were not trusted by their by their agency and, and that supervisee in particular ended up leaving not just their agency they left the field so it was a very impactful experience going through that so again, as supervisors, you're also leaders, right? In your organization, your agency. So I, I do, you know, kind of put out this information about, you know, how organizations respond, right? And primarily when we talk about how they respond, we're talking about people removed from clinical work, typically who maybe don't understand it um, or maybe don't understand or recognize the impact that something like this can have. Um, things out of my study that came up and I didn't ask this, it was just, just came up, which tells me that it's, it's definitely a thing, you know, was feeling unsupported, not having supportive policies about leave time, 
not having, I mean, I was shocked to hear mental health agencies not having EAPs, not having, you know, resource material for their clinicians, um, kind of perpetuating that stereotype, right, of clinicians are superhuman, we nothing affects us, we totally take care of ourselves, which we all know is, is totally false. Um, and I'll tell you, these emotions, like the anger, the frustration, the disappointment in their agency was fresh years later. So again, kind of stepping back from that one-on-one -on -one supervision, I, I challenge you to look at your agency and organization and how has it responded before? And is that helpful to your clinicians or, or is it potentially even, even harmful? Before you do anything to support a supervisee, always make sure you take a step back and make sure you're okay, right? It's, you know, make sure you're okay before you check on if someone else is okay. And if you aren't, ready to support them immediately, then you need to help find someone that can, whether that's in the agency outside of it. Be very careful of assuming what a supervisee wants. One of the most classic things that I've heard of over and over again, and I, it's, it's one of the most disarming and, and disappointing things I hear about is clinical supervisors who, when a, a clinician has a client death, they call the clinician in to tell them, and then they cancel the rest of their day without talking to the clinician. So first off, you're now perpetuating that they're not trusted, that they're not competent, and you may also inadvertently be putting other clients at risk. But I hear this happen over and over again. Now, that may be what a clinician needs, but we want to ask them, right? Because I can tell you in some of the experiences I had, um, when I was told about the 16 year old, the best thing for me was I stayed and I worked my 10 hour shift. That was what I needed. That's what I wanted to do. And that's what I needed to do for me. But I was asked, right? If that had, if I had just been sent home, all I would have done was spent that 10 hours blaming myself, running it over and over and just digging myself into that deeper hole. Um, you also want to make sure you're offering support that's within your role, right? And respect boundaries, you shouldn't be their only support about this. You know, encourage them to talk to other folks as appropriate without, you know, disclosing private information, all that good stuff. But they need to have other folks to, to pull from. They need other people in their support system that when they hear that something like this happened, that person can say, oh, my God, that really sucks. I'm so sorry that happened to you. And not workshop it, not try to figure it out. Just support them, right? And keep it in mind that support doesn't have a timeline. The last things I'm going to leave you with when you have this happen with a supervisee is please explain to them and walk them through what will happen next. Again, this should hopefully be a review. Hopefully they should know this. Um, be clear of what your role is and what their role is in what happens next. Answer their questions as best you can and be prepared for potentially very personal questions. Um, be prepared for questions about maybe attending a funeral can I contact the family? Those are all things you're going to have to potentially work through with someone and, and just talk about it. Um, make sure they have other supports, but also make sure that you're talking about it as well. You are going to be an extraordinarily important piece of them, you know, dealing and navigating this loss as a professional and also as, as a person. I have a lot more content. It goes into some more things about policies and procedures and notification stuff and postvention that I'm, I'm, you will get on the slide deck. And it has also all the references and things that I talked about today. Um, 